I love when Pokemon go against expectations. Like all of the fish and sea creature Pokemon that are not water type, or the literal ship anchor that isn't steel type. This dandelion. <laughs> Let's make it a fire ghost type invasive alien thing, right? Oh, and this thistle? It's a dragon. Drudagon is many things, and one of them is ugly. Another one is hard to say because my dyslexic butt wants to jumble these gosh dang letters around. Druidagon, the Drudgedagon, Druidge, Drudge, Drudge. But that name and the way it is spelled poorly does have a purpose. It tells us a lot about its inspirational origins. Specifically, it tells us it's Welsh, at least partially. Yes, that Welsh. Wales, the small country in the UK with a red dragon on their flag. Yeah. Drudagon was British before it was a cool thing for Pokemon to be, and that fact, along with everything else about it, is actually really cool. It may even pull from, arguably, the most important dragon in European lore, the dragon defeated by Saint George, with the help of a young princess's love and purity. Drudagon is deeper than expected, even if it looks kinda like a diseased oak leaf. Oh no, I'm sorry, is it a condition? <laughs> We should probably cover the basics first. Just looking at Dredagon, it's clearly inspired by reptiles for its base, as a lot of dragon types are. I mean, duh. Most dragons from mythology and legends the world over are inspired by reptiles, but Dredagon is especially reptile-y, or more specifically, very lizardy, even by dragon Pokemon standards. First off, it warms its body by absorbing sunlight with its wings. When its body temperature falls, it can no longer move. So, like most reptiles, it's cold-blooded, which is known as being endothermic, whereas warm-blooded animals like mammals and birds are exothermic. And it absorbing sunlight with its leafy wings just points even more towards its planty origins, which we'll get to. Drudagon. Yeah, you know what, actually, I'm gonna look up how it's pronounced. Drudagon. What? Drud again! Drud again? Drud again? Me with my mispronunciations? Drud again are vicious and cunning. They take up residence in nests dug out by other Pokemon, treating the stolen nests as their own lairs. That also describes many lizard and snake species. While a lot of them can make their own burrows, if given half the chance, they will gladly steal the caves or burrows of other species, or move into a burrow that has been abandoned. And this is also a very common trait of Western dragons in both myth and modern legends, like Smaug from The Hobbit. And also, many snakes and lizards will chase their prey through burrows, which Dredagon, Dredagon does a lot too, apparently hence all the Pokedex entries. Then, Dredigan's red skin on its face is harder than rock, and that is a perfect Pokemonification of the fact that a lot of lizard species have hard, spiky heads, like the Bearded Dragon, which also happens to have dragon in its name. Bearded dragons are a kind of agama and are aggressive, especially the males. They will eat just about anything they can get their strong jaws on, including mice and other small animals that lives in caves, and they themselves retreat into caves during the hottest part of the day when it's too hot for even their endothermic bodies to handle. And being as spiky as they are, yeah, I'd say that's a pretty good inspirational source, uh, but there is a pretty glaring issue. That color scheme. Why? Oh, why? Is that the color scheme? Well, that comes from another kind of Agama, the red-headed rock Agama, whose scientific name is Agama Agama, the most Agama of Agama, you see. You may not like it, but this is what peak Agama performance looks like. They too are very aggressive and territorial, living in caves and rock crevices, and notably, Dredigan's Japanese name is Krimgan, which is a mixture of crimson for its head color and gan, which can mean both rock and face. So that just further supports the red-headed rock agama inspiration, as if it even needed any more solidification. Those are literally the colors. But actually, the spikes on the edge of the top of the head look a lot like the cute little crested gecko, who are named that due to their spiky little crests along their eyebrow area, and it goes all the way down to their cute little tail, which is just like Dredigan's head spikes and tail spikes, especially since its tail spikes are the same color as its head. Okay, so that's the the lizard inspirations out of the way. So now it's on to the dragon inspirations, right? Well, not yet. First, we gotta talk about plants. 
because it is one. I mean, its wings, which it can't even use to fly, look like spiky leaves, like the leaves on an oak tree. I mean, look at it shiny. That just screams oak leaf now. So it's a dragon with an oak leaf body is what I've always said, but then we started the deep and complex process of Pokemon research. I mean, there is the Quercus rubra, or the northern red oak, and other species of the Lobate section of the Quercus. I'm bad with words. A lot of these are also native to the areas that Unova is based on, but none of them have quite the right leaf shape. And after all of that research, I then took just one more look at Dredagon's body, and then it hit me. Dredagon is like a thistle! I mean, the way their colors work even. Green plant, bright, blooming, spiky head. Thistles are a group of flowering plants that are usually covered in sharp prickles on the stem and leaves, and are often seen as a nuisance and are considered a noxious weed in most of the places they've been introduced to. Almost like Dredagon invading other Pokemon caves and chasing prey into spots they can't back out from. You can't escape Dredagon. It is ruthless and insistent and so dang spiky like a thistle. They're nearly impossible to eradicate once they've gotten into your garden, especially since many thistles are biennial and they spend the first half of their life as a stout taproot that can extend as deep as six feet underground, significantly deeper than most plants its size. It's like digging its own cave. Some species are even able to spread via rhizomes underground, so just because you pulled up the plant and got most of the root, it doesn't mean you've stopped it completely. Like Drudigan and caves, eh? Drudigan is especially reminiscent of the milk thistle and cotton thistle, and its shiny is like how their blossoms turn yellow as they dry out and start to produce actual seeds. Milk thistle has kind of a silly genus name, Silly Bum. Look, is a silly bum. Milk thistle is native to the Mediterranean, but it has been introduced elsewhere, like most of North America, which is where Dredigan's home region of Unova is based. And then the cotton thistle is a genus of thistles that also looks a bit like Dredigan, and it's known for being able to grow just about anywhere with at least some access to water, as it always outcompetes the local plants, often becoming such a big and spiky mess that it drives away the local animals and makes removal almost impossible impossible without resorting to just burning it all down. Which isn't hard to believe when this spiky monstrosity is a single plant, and it too has been introduced to North America and taken over. But now, if we want something with both leaves, like Dredigan's wings, and the yellow of its shiny's head while still fertile and alive, we need to look no further than the Holy Thistle. While not a true thistle, Holy Thistle, or Saint Benedict's Thistle, has a yellow flower just like Dredigan's shiny head, and it being named after a saint makes it all the better. Saint George, the patron saint of England, has quite the dragon-slaying tale to tell, and it's arguably the most famous in Europe today. A large, fierce dragon was terrorizing the local. But it stops when they start sacrificing animals and treasures to it. But after a while, they've sacrificed so many animals and riches to it that they don't even have enough to take care of themselves. So they start sacrificing humans to it. And those people are chosen randomly. Eventually, the king's young daughter is randomly drawn. And he tries to stop it, but the people insist and threaten to riot if he doesn't subject his own families to the laws he's imposed on his people. So he goes through with it and drops her off near the dragon's cave. But St. George swoops in out of nowhere and attacks the dragon before it eats her. The princess then throws her girdle, a sash worn around the waist that in Christian traditions represents the person's devotion to God, and on top of that represents purity in women. And it gets around the dragon's neck and instantaneously it is tamed, and she can now walk it around on a leash. So now, just swap some key elements. The girdle is a Pokeball, George is Drayden, the old dragon-type gym leader who also acted as Iris' mentor, and the young princess then is Iris, who dresses like a princess, Tiara and all, and who was revered for her ability to sense the feelings of dragon Pokemon, and thus is able to easily tame them where others fail. Her name even, Iris, is a name which symbolizes both nobility and faith, which are things the princess from the story of St. George and the 
dragon represents. And of course, St. George's Cross is what would become the flag of England itself. So bam, Dredigan is an English dragon, but it gets better because it also perfectly pulls in elements from the other two countries on the Great Britain Isle. Scotland and Wales. You see, back to the thistles. They are important symbolically in Scottish culture and are featured prominently in a lot of their heraldry and were even found on a lot of their coins in the days of yore. And there's a good reason. As local legend has it, there was once an invading Norse army and they were trying to sneak up to an encampment of a Scottish army at night. But a Norseman stepped on a thistle and yelped in pain. This yelp alerted the Scottish guards who were thus made aware of the sneaky Norse and the day was saved. And honestly, the thistle fits Sc Scottish culture pretty perfectly, and they know this. One of their mottos sort of directly references thistles and how kind of ouch they are. Nemo me ipune lasesit, which means uh, no one provokes me with impunity, which both fits thistles and the historic Scots very well. The thistle in this case is typically portrayed as a cotton thistle due to its terrifying size and especially spiky leaves, but in reality, the main thistle that it most likely was, given the location and time period, is the Cursirium vulgare, otherwise known as the spear thistle or bull thistle, which is actually the kind of thistle I've been getting attacked by this entire time. And it's the national flower of Scotland, which like, yeah, makes sense given everything we've just learned. And it's the flower used to symbolize Scotland whenever appropriate, like all over these examples. The rose is England, the shamrock is Northern Ireland, and the thistle, Scotland. Does, does Wales not get represented here? They are forgotten even in their own homeland. Wow. No wonder the country is just missing in Galar. Well, let's go ahead and go south to Wales now. Clearly, we've established that thistles have a lot to do with Great Britain's history, and they grow all over the- Ah! Ah! Oh, well, hey, Wales is right there. They have a way cool dragon on their flag. Honestly, one of the coolest flags in the world. And yeah, I definitely think the red head of Drudigan could pull from it too. This is the Welsh dragon, Thrive Goch. And it being on their flag means, of course, it's a big symbol in Welsh mythology and culture. In Arthurania, the actual, real, official way to refer to the King Arthur Knights of the Round Table mythos as a whole, King Vor Vortigern sees a red dragon defeat a white dragon after a long and drawn out battle, and a young Merlin tells him that the red dragon represents the Britons, the people who lived in Wales at the time, and the white dragon represents the invading Saxons, and thus, the fight predicted the defeat of the Saxons by the Britons, and thus, the red dragon is now a symbol of Wales as a whole. And of course, on top of the head color and the spiky neck, the name Thrag has a set of double D's in it, just like Drodagon's name. In fact, double D's like this is a very Welsh thing. That sounded weird. But remember how Drodagon's Japanese name translates to Crimson Rockhead? Well, the Welsh word for Crimson is almost Drodagon's name, if you were a non-Welsh person trying to say it. Welsh is notoriously difficult to pronounce, though. But Crimson is Radigoch. Let's just slide a D in the beginning of that, because, you know, the Pokémon drudges, so you have to add the word drudge in there a little bit, and now you got Drudigoch. Drudigoch. Drudigon. Drudigon. Because it's also a dragon. And what all of this means is that Drudigon sort of perfectly represents all three countries on Great Britain. England, Scotland, and Wales. And then the reason it's in Unova is because those thistles are found all over the island here, but are also extremely common in the US now. Hence me having this. Even just this little bit. I'm so poked and itchy everywhere. But ow! But also, Unova, New York City, is one of the most diverse cities in the world, famous for its huge influx of immigrants. But its theming of world empires, which is fitting because New York is the Empire State, and, and is represented by mainly the three starters. They're the Chinese, Japanese, and French empires. But perhaps you could extend that theming to other Pokemon. Thus, Drudagon, this uggo, spiky, mean old dragon, represents the British Empire. 
how perfectly fitting. Oh yeah, and if I don't mention them, the whole comment section will be about it, because the most common inspiration I see people pointing to when it comes to Dredigan are draconic gargoyles. That might, after all, explain why so many of its Pokedex entries talk about it absorbing sunlight and not being able to move when it gets too cold. You see, that's the exact opposite thing that gargoyles do. Gargoyles turn to stone and cannot move when in sunlight. So Game Freak may have taken a gargoyle and flipped the script on you. Though at the same time, this is also just kind of... A lizard thing? Every lizard likes basking in the sun or under a heat lamp because if they get too cold they can't move. That's just a lizard thing. Dredigan's lizardy. But admittedly also, Dredigan having a hunched back and rough skin is quite reminiscent of these draconic gargoyles, which are found throughout Europe historically, and even plenty of older buildings in New York City. While gargoyles depicting imps and demons are significantly more common, draconic ones aren't that rare, and thanks to their longer necks, they were especially suited as rain drainage spouts, which was their original use. They're water-breathing dragon heads made of metal or stone to help get rainwater off of a ceiling. But anyway, it's not the only Pokémon to reference whales, there is another. It's mega cool, and you can learn all about that right here. And until next time, never stop using your noggin. If I'm gonna pull this, I need some safety. Uh, never mind. Layering up. Oh, this is a left hand glove. <laughs> <laughs>